Good morning, Christ Church, and welcome. Let's stand to our feet as we come before our God. We remind our hearts that He's the God who saves and delivers, who holds all the power. So we trust in Him as we sit this out. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Yes, He does. And just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of Him. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Who oh, praise the name and makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside. Just one word, and you revive every tree. Just one touch, I feel the power. I was a slave to 
Jesus sets free is free indeed. The reality is today that Jesus frees us from the prison of being far from him. And he tells you today that you don't have to be shackled to your past, that sin doesn't have to be your identity anymore, but here's who you are today. You are a son or daughter of the living God. For freedom, Christ set us free, amen? Amen, you can grab a seat. That's right, that is so right. You're a preacher back there probably someday. My name is Brandon Delage. I'm on staff here at Christ Church. Got a few things I wanna make you aware of this morning. First things first, church family, pull out your phones, head to the Christ Church app in the dashboard and let us know that you're here today and how we can be praying for you. I promise I will not be offended if you're on your phones right now. I would love for you to do that. Please do that for us. Guests, welcome to Christ Church. We're so glad that you're here. Hopefully we caught you on your way in at the guest tent where you would receive a gift and a guest card. Do us a favor, fill out that guest card either digitally or by hand. Uh, let us know you're here today and how we can serve you in any way, shape, or form. But if we didn't get that opportunity, we still would love the chance to meet you and to give you a gift. And we do that at a place called The Hub. It's just the carpeted area in the lobby. You'll see leaders there with name tags on. They can get you your gift as well as answer any questions you have about following Jesus or our church. So please stop by The Hub. If you're online joining us today, welcome to Christ Church digitally. You can text get info to 94000. Somebody from our team will follow up with you this week. Well, church family and guests alike, spring season is upon us at Christ Church. Enrollment is available for our groups, our studies, and our care groups. And there are all kinds of great opportunities for you to grow together with us this season. The first opportunity is through gospel community and what we call community groups here at Christ Church. If you have been coming here on the weekend and you are not known and able to serve one another and love one another in a community group, now is the time to enroll in a group and get involved here by growing through gospel community. Second, grow in gospel knowledge through studies. Maybe you're here on Sunday mornings and you're like, man, I wanna know more about the Bible. Pastor Adam seems to know a lot. I wanna know more about it like he does. Well, studies are our way of teaching you that. And you can do that in the book of Acts study, the systematic theology course we've got. We got a creation study coming your way. Sign up in the app today. Don't wait another second. Grow in your gospel knowledge. And finally, grow in gospel power through our care groups. These groups are designed for people in a season of overwhelming sin or who are enduring a great season of suffering. And I would offer you the opportunity to grow together in understanding the power that the gospel holds for your life today. We have opportunities for biblical finances, for prodigal hope is one of the courses as well. And finally, we have abortion recovery. So please sign up for any one of these things today. Don't wait another season to get involved at Christ Church in this way. One more opportunity I wanna make you guys aware of is for our 60 plus community. It is our maximizing your retirement. This is not for us young folk, you know, like planning for it, you know, going to a financial advisor. This is for our 60 plus crowd who is seizing this season of their life and learning how to maximize their retirement on March 14th. Got a guest speaker coming. It's gonna be legit. You gotta sign up in the app as fast as possible because it's gonna be filling up. So please seize your retirement, maximize your retirement today, 60 plus crowd. Finally, we are growing together at Christ Church. I wanna offer you the opportunity to grow together today by worshiping God through giving. You might not link directly worshiping God through giving and growing together, but Jesus does for us in Matthew chapter six where he says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And what I would suggest to you today is that you can't grow to the fullest extent that God would want you to here if you are not partnering with us in giving and to put your treasure where you want your heart to be. So I'm gonna offer you the opportunity to give today, whether it's online, in the app, or in the black boxes in back, however it is you give, whenever it is you give, that God would love to meet with you in that opportunity this week. So would you join me as I pray? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship with you with brothers and sisters in Christ and guests alike. Lord, we're praying that you would move again today in our services, in this gathering, Lord that you would move in our groups, that people whose marriages are on the brink who are hurting, but they're hiding from it, that they'd get into a group, Lord, and people would lovingly point them to God's word and what you say for their marriage, and you'd see it restored. God, for the person suffering, with a prodigal son or daughter who's wandered from the faith and hurting, Lord, would you give them gospel hope through our care groups, and Lord, people who want to understand the Bible more clearly? Would people have the lights turn on and the Bible just be unlocked for them in a new and fresh way in our studies this season? God, this is all made possible by the generosity of your people. And we're standing in the sacrifice of so many right here, right now. And God, we pray now 
that as we give, that you would enable many more of us to go for your glory and for your fame. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand together as we make this our prayer to the Lord. soul, every life in this place desperately needs the sufficiency of Christ, the grace and the mercy of our Lord, the love that has been lavished upon us through Jesus. The Bible says that because we have a great high priest who is familiar with our weaknesses and our sorrows, yet who did not sin, we have a way into the throne room, the throne of grace. So may we come boldly, knowing that we will find mercy and we will find grace to help in time of need. We need him. So let's lift up our hearts, our burdens, all that we are, and let's cry out 
to the supplier and sufficiency of our life to Jesus. I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. My one defense and my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Let's sing that to him again. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. My one defense and my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. of your people, and you come, and you deliver, and you rescue. You are our hope and our strength. Thank you, God. Perfect in love, here you are, robed in majesty and light. Glory beyond earth and sky, who is like the
King Jesus, King Jesus, all glory to God alone. Praise to the one who holds the throne, name above all names. King Jesus, King Jesus, all glory to God alone. Praise to the one who gave it all, name above all names. King Jesus, King Jesus. Jesus, we delight to be your people, to bow before you, to submit under you, to bring praise to you, to worship you. We delight in it. We have not earned our way into our worship. You have humbled yourself, taking our humanity, and you have earned on our behalf through your perfect obedience, through your substitution death in our place, and through your glorious resurrection never to die again, you have earned for us, through faith in your finished work, the rights to be called sons and daughters of God. You are the eternal one, the uncreated one. You are our king. You have the name above every name. You are the king of every king. You are the Lord of all the lords, and we are your people. We are so thankful for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's ministry among us as we sing and pray, and now as we engage with the Word, as we fellowship with one another. Oh, Holy Spirit, continue your work among us. Now, lead us so that it would become more obvious that we are the King's people in every single aspect of our lives. Change the way we think, alter the course of the way we live, affect us, comfort us, guide us in the truth, we pray. We're dependent upon you, Spirit, now as we open the word. We wanna get it, we wanna understand it, and we wanna be gotten by it. We want our lives to be affected. God, I pray for revival among us. I pray for the asleep in the light to be awakened by your ministry, Holy Spirit. I pray for the wayward 
the wanderers to be drawn back. I pray for the dead to be made alive. New birth through your ministry, Holy Spirit, with the word. Do all of the things that you do, we pray. We're dependent, we're expectant, we're eager, and we're praying in faith, believing it's what you intend to do with this time. So we pray it together in Jesus' name. Can you agree with that? We'll say amen. 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 You can be seated. Well, good to see you, Christ Church. Thank you so much, family, for being here. Glad that you've made this a priority uh, in your weekend and uh, every week. So thankful for what God does when we meet together and uh, trust that God will work powerfully again uh, as we meet together as a family. Uh, those who are joining in online, welcome to you. Uh, some of our family are no doubt uh, scattering out of here for spring break time. I think we're in that season. And if you're joining in while you're away, thank you for doing that. We're eager for you to be back. If you're homebound, you can't be here, uh, you're stuck somewhere and want to be here, we miss you. And I want you to know that. We're eager for you to come back and be a part of our worship together as soon as you possibly can. And if you're kicking the tires, if you're a guest online, I hope that what you experience uh, through the online uh, experience of our time will lead you, if possible, to be here with us. There's something very different about what God does when we meet together as his people, and I would encourage you to do that. Thank, thank you for joining in that way to check it all out before you come and visit with us. And guests in the room, thank you for being here as well. We love you. We're grateful for you. We've been praying for you. I don't know how you came. I don't know what's on your mind. I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know what's swirling around in your life right now, but we've been praying that you would be aware that, uh, one, you're welcomed here. We're really thankful that you came. Two, that you would know Jesus is the king here and uh, that that would be obvious. And three, that you would know that God is engaging with you here. And uh, whether you know him already uh, or whether you've never met him yet, we're praying that God would really work in a powerful way in your life. And one of the key aspects of his uh, working in our lives is his word. So we're going to open up the Bible together Guests, you can join us, church family. We're going to all open up to John chapter 18. If you're a guest, page 850 in that little black hardback copy of the Bible that's underneath of a seat nearby, uh, we'll get you right to where we are today in John 18. And uh, if you need to borrow ours, you don't have it on a device or something, borrow it. Use it and engage with us in the scripture. And if you don't own a Bible, you don't have to just borrow it. You can just claim it. You can write your name in it right now. And uh, say it's mine, and take it home with you, bring it back next weekend, and, uh, and be in God's word, uh, not just when we meet here, but through the week. I would encourage you toward that, so take full advantage of page 850. We are marching our way, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, through John's gospel, and we're on the home stretch. We're almost done. We're coming down into the last section. John has written in big gaps of time because this is an argument. John's not writing a chronological history as much as he's arguing with us to convince us to believe. So he's written in huge chunks of time. He's taken months and years and kind of put things together in a way that he wants them uh, in seven signs, uh, expressions of the power of Christ, and then conversations and teaching of Christ in order to convince us to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior for our soul. And he is the, capital S, one and only, eternal son of God. He is the uncreated one who took human flesh to dwell among us, to be tempted like us, yet without sin to die for us, and to be raised from the dead never to die again, so that we might, through belief in him, have life in his name. That's why he wrote all this down. It was so that we would believe. And if you are a believer, that you would believe freshly, and that I would believe freshly because we've engaged with what has been given to us by God, the Holy Spirit, through John in these chapters. But we are not in big gaps of time. Now we have, we have come down into the final minutes of the life of Jesus. And John now is talking about things that are happening in hours and minutes. And days will drag on in chapters here. Because these are the final hours and moments of the life of Jesus before he takes the cross and pays the penalty for the sins of all and all of the sins for those who would believe. So John 18 is not a throwaway. It is absolutely important for us to gain from it the perspective needed so that we can appreciate what we're engaging with in the cross of Christ, in the suffering of Christ. We might be tempted to think that this whole situation is spiraling out of control 
but John 18 reminds us it's not. And we might think that in John 18, it seems as if the failure of those around Jesus is really dominant. No, it is his success in this moment for our salvation. And we might be tempted to think there's nobody who can be going through what he's going through and still be the king, but John 18 reminds us he is in fact the king of kings and he is going to the cross to save a people who were not a people to become his people. Amen? Okay, so let me dive into this with you with a word. Here's a word. I want you to I want you to what is it? It's 10:47. Let's see what 10:47 on Sunday gives on your dictionary in your brain. All right, here's the word. You try to think of a definition of it. This is a word that's hard to define without using the word in the definition. You know that game where you can't say the word? This is one of those. And it's far easier for this word for you to point to it when you see it than it is for you to give a definition of it. You ready for the word? Here it is, faithful. What does the word faithful mean? You're like, my hamster's just sitting on the wheel. He's not going anywhere. We're not getting anything done up there. No data's running. I got nothing. What does faithful mean? Now, we can point to it, right? And uh, we can give illustrations of it. Let me give you what Merriam-Webster gives to us as a definition and see if this helps us frame it a little bit as we jump into John 18 again this morning. Webster said that faithfulness could be defined as steadfast in affection or allegiance, a faithful friend. It could be defined, secondly, as firm in adherence to promises or in observance of duty, a faithful employee, right? You can point to that. Thirdly, given with strong assurance, a faithful promise. And fourthly, true to the facts, to a standard, or to an original, a faithful copy faithful. It is a key word in our Christian dictionary, and it's a key word culturally around us. And it is, I believe, to be the central consideration of what we find in John chapter 18 as we engage with the faithful Christ. That's what we're going to call this study today, the faithful Christ from John chapter 18, verses 12 down through verse number 27. We're done with creative titles. We're over. We're already in chapter 18, the faithful Christ. That's what we're calling it, and that's what we're all about. Now listen, in the week past, for most of us, in the week past, it would seem more that we could put the word faithlessness more, more frequently on our lives than faithfulness, right? I mean, faithless seems like more of a tag that goes with our lives often more than faithful. In fact, the Proverbs speak to this. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6 says that a lot of people will talk about their faithfulness. And then the second part of the proverb is, but a faithful man or woman, who can find? Who can find one of those? Who can find one who endures, who is steadfast, who is firm, who is faithful to the duty, faithful to the cause, faithful to the promise, faithful to the relationship? Many will say they're faithful, but a faithful man or woman who can find Proverbs 20 and verse 6. And we know from Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23 that on the day of judgment, there are those faithful stewards who will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the rest. So as we come now to the text, we find one who is faithful. One who is entirely faithful. On the way to the cross, After the garden, in the middle of the night, falsely accused, illegally arrested, mock trials, he will be experiencing violence beyond what we could ever comprehend, and he is faithful. He is the faithful Christ. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this out loud now, but listen, I want you to engage with this as we read. I think this is sometimes a fruitful way for us to think. I want you to find yourself in what we read. I want you to plug yourself in. If I were there, this is where, because of who I am, this is where I could most likely see myself in the story. And if you choose that you're the Christ, we have to talk after the service, okay? Okay. All right, I want you to look around, and I want us to focus on Christ, but I want us to find ourselves because I believe Christ will be exalted among us and through us in the week to come if we'll see his faithfulness together. All right, here we go. Let's read God's word. 
The Apostle John, eyewitness, one of the disciples, gives this to us under the superintending work of the Holy Spirit. It's God's word. Let's read it, beginning in verse 12, where we left off last weekend. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with him, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. These are the words of God for us this morning. May the spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Here's the big idea. You want to jot something down? This is the sermon. This is the whole study of this section in a sentence. Make sure you get this. Put this in your app or in your journal or whatever you're doing. In every moment of my faithlessness, we're going to plug ourselves in and see ourselves here. Jesus remains faithful to save. This is not an accident. He is not out of control. The situation has not spiraled away from him. He is remaining faithful. He is enduring, he is steadfast, he is firm, he is accomplishing what he set out to do in every moment of my faithlessness and yours. Jesus remains faithful to save us. And I want to show that to you in four expressions. Four expressions, and the expressions, and rightly so. Listen, when we read this, we are captured by what's happening around Jesus. But in the, in the moments of the chaos and confusion and the injustice of what's taking place, the illegality of what's happening here, there's Jesus standing. There's Jesus speaking. There's Jesus sinless. There's Jesus enduring because he is faithful and remains faithful. He has not failed and he will not fail. Even as we meet him here in the darkest hours of the middle of the night in John chapter 18. So let me give you these four displays. Here's how we'll do it. Jesus remains faithful. That's what I want you to feel, and that's what I want to walk away from in my own heart and in your heart so that it would affect the way we live. Jesus remains faithful when these four expressions of faithlessness are mine. You ready? Number one, let's see if this fits. Jesus remains faithful when I am a blinded enemy. Now, immediately when we get back into the text in that first little paragraph, we are engaging with spiritual blindness. And it is absolutely appropriate and undeniable that we're dealing with enemies of Jesus. Now, it may be difficult for us on first glance to think, well, that's me. 
That's the way I am. That's the way I was. And that's the way I'm tempted to go back to that I am a blinded enemy. But I want you to see their blindness, their enemy position. And then I trust that we can, in, if we can absorb some of the reality instead of shaking our heads in dismay at these people, but rather appreciate the faithfulness of Christ in this moment while this is all around him and happening to him. So it's a little bit confusing. I, I picked this up in verse 12. He's been arrested. Don't forget, he's been arrested by his own choice. He, with a word, knocked everybody down. Remember that? Let them all stand back up, then let them arrest him. The funny thing is they bound him as if that's going to do any good. He could say a word and end this thing, and he's been arrested, and they led him first to Annas. And now, if you're, if you're wondering, what is going on here? Annas, and why do we care that he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas and all this high priest stuff? Listen, here, let me just clarify this really quick. Annas is the high priest by lineage. In the law, the high priestly role was a lifetime appointment. You gave it hereditarily, went down the line, and Annas is the high priest. There is no other high priest until Annas ceases to live, and then it passes on to the next in his line to be the high priest of Israel until the Roman Empire took over. And in the Roman Empire, that high priestly spot, which was a massive, maybe the most influential leader in the people of Israel, became a really important chess piece for politics. So they would assign a high priest and move things around so that they could control the control of the nation of Israel. Does that make sense? So they picked his son-in-law, Caiaphas, not to be too offensive, but to be their person for that year. That's why it says Caiaphas was the high priest that year. Nobody got to be the priest for that year unless that year was the end of their life. So they go first to Annas. Why? Because he's the big dog. He's the alpha. He's the real high priest. So what's going to happen here is an informal interaction with Annas, then a formal one with Caiaphas, which is ironic because they're acting like this is legal. It's illegal in so many ways, according to their own law. And then there'll be a third formal trial before Pontius Pilate, the one that you know of well. That's what's going to take place here. And in all of it, I want you to appreciate the faithfulness of Jesus in the midst of this kind of spiritual blindness in enemies against him. Annas is an enemy. Caiaphas is an enemy. And they are blinded. And all of the religious leaders that are still there, all of those who are standing around inside that home, inside the house of Annas, before Annas sends him up to Caiaphas's house, all of them are blinded to who Jesus is. They are truly what he said. He said in Matthew 15 and verse 14 that they were the blind leading the blind. They were the blind guides. That's absolutely true. But as soon as we see it, as soon as we engage with that, we're tempted to think, well, that's not me. I'm not one of them. I wouldn't be there. If I was there, I wouldn't be there. If I was there, I wouldn't be that. And I just want to remind you, the spiritual blindness is the condition in which we were born and enemies of Christ, enemies of God, is the position of our nature as rebels against him. That's who we were, all of us who follow Christ. And if you do not follow Christ, you are still marked by this spiritual blindness. Jesus just made this so clear. So clear and so ironic, isn't it, that Caiaphas was the one that said that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people instead of all the people dying. There's spiritual blindness. There he was in front of Christ. And in John chapter 11, verse 50 to 53, John the disciple tells us, hey, that wasn't said on accident. He was being used to say something, to prophesy to what was going to happen. One man would die for the entire nation. Spiritual blindness. So as soon as you start to think, well, I'm better than this, I'm different than this, I wouldn't be in this group, let me remind you of John chapter 9, you can jot it down, verse 39 to 41. In fact, let's do a little field trip. You want a field trip? Let's go left in our Bible. You got your Bible there? Make the happy noise and let's go to chapter 9. Turn over there or scroll there and let's read a few verses. John chapter 9, I think we studied this in 1996. Um, <laughs> If you were with us then, uh, this is the story of the blind man who was healed. Remember this? They questioned his parents, and his parents were like, well, you talk to him. He's a grown man. 
Remember that whole conversation that he bumps into Jesus? He doesn't know who he's talking to because seeing is a relatively new thing for him. And uh, he meets Jesus. Jesus puts this commentary on it. Look at the end of chapter 9 in verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see, that is those who think they see, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees, that's the people who are in Annas' house right now. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Now listen, here's the crazy thing. What he's saying to them is if you were saying we are blind, you would be very close to the forgiveness of your sins through faith in the finished work of the Messiah. But because you don't think you're blind, you're still blind. The first thing that changes when our blindness is removed is we see our blindness. We know that we don't see it. We hadn't seen ourselves the right way. We were blinded to who we really were in our sin. We hadn't seen Christ the right way. We had not perceived and understood who he is and why he came and what he did. The first aspect of the removal of blindness is the recognition of blindness. So Jesus is faithful to save, which means he's faithful to give sight to the blind. That's us. And when I was a, and when I drift toward being a blinded enemy, friendship with the world is enmity with God, when I drift back toward not seeing appropriately, when things get muddy again, remember here in John 18 that faithful Jesus went to the mock trial and he remained there, he stayed there, he did that so that we would be saved from our blindness and moved from enemies to friends and sons and daughters of the Most High God. We have a faithful Christ, amen? And listen, he saved the people that were there I don't want to jump ahead to our stuff too much because I'm so excited about where we're going. But in John chapter 19, when Jesus has died on the cross, do you remember who comes and gets him? Joseph of Arimathea and a guy named Nicodemus. That's John 3, Nicodemus. That's you must be born again, Nicodemus. That's John 3, 16, Nicodemus. He comes and Joseph comes, Joseph having followed him as the Messiah, but afraid to associate with him, overcomes that and come. Why? Because the blindness is removed even for those who are here in the moment spiritually blind. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, in the early church, in the first season of the church in Jerusalem, it says that the gospel was spreading, people were being saved, and even many priests were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because the faithful Christ saves the blind, and gives us spiritual sight. Don't shake your head. Instead, treasure your spiritual ability to see and worship your Savior and live on his mission in this coming week. Got it? That's the first expression. Jesus remains faithful when I am a blinded enemy. Number two, jot it down. Jesus remains faithful when I am a terrified follower. When I am a terrified follower, follower the story now moves into the second scene and we go outside the house in verse 15 this is probably the most familiar part to us Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple the another disciple is John he never names himself he calls himself the beloved disciple or another disciple and the things that he's about to do and say about the scenario means he has to be the one that was there because he heard and saw things with details that only an eyewitness would be there. So there's another disciple, that's John. John, even as a fisherman, somehow had a relationship either to Caiaphas or to Annas, and so he was let in to the situation and could stand in the courtyard. He goes and gets Peter, and Peter is at the door waiting, and immediately the servant girl at the door, when she opens it to Peter, Ask him, you're not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he immediately, in the terror of the circumstances, he denies Christ. He's terrified. And I think we're prone sometimes to miss what else is going on here. There are two disciples that are here. There are nine that are not Nine have run and fled, and they're nowhere to be found. One of the two that are here, it's fascinating, in John Mark, John, in Mark's gospel, uh, Mark says that there was one other young guy 
who was a disciple of Peter's, who was running with them, was running with Peter, and got caught in that, and they ripped his undergarment off, and he ran away buck naked. That's in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> the words buck naked are not in the Bible. I just chose to use those right now. And who was that? That was John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark as the disciple of Peter. Two disciples are here. One is silent. John doesn't do anything. He doesn't say anything. He gets Peter in and doesn't do another thing. And Peter denies. Loved ones, listen, you are either with the silent nine or the absent nine, the silent John or the denying Peter. But I assure you this, the faithful Christ who's inside the house, the faithful Christ who's standing before this trial, this interrogation, this ridiculous, blinded, horrific, wicked scene is being faithful in order to save us when we are the terrified followers, when we have been around Jesus and orbited around him and would even claim to be his. And yet in the moment of the, the rubber meeting the road, we're terrified and we do not respond. We run away. We don't say anything or we say the wrong thing and deny him. That's who he saves. That's us. And when I'm a terrified follower, he has been faithful and he remains faithful. Faithful. Now, the end of this is kind of strange, isn't it? Did you, uh, some of you, the only thing you heard in here was charcoal fire. You started thinking about all the things you want to do this week on your charcoal fire. I think that's just a literary thing. John gave us that little scene because he's going to cut, like, think of it like a movie. He's going to pan away from that scene and go inside. Then he's going to cut back and he's going to come back to the fire scene. So he gives us some kind of a, a, a little bit of a detailed framework, literarily, to bring us back in just a moment. Here's what I want you to hear. Terrified followers are redeemed. They're saved. They're given courage. They are changed by the faithful Christ. We've got a response to terror. In fact, how many, in this room right here, how many of you like to be the person who hides and jumps out and scares somebody? Who is that? Who are you? Raise your hand, you wicked people. Raise your hand. You own it. You like that. And how many of you in this room do not like it that they do that to you? Yes, we are the same people. Now, here's the thing. When that happens to you, you got one of two options. And I'm telling you, I choose violence. <laughs> Just going to tell you. My kids had to learn. This is not, I do not giggle and say that was fun. No, 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 no. Something bad will happen. You got two options. What are they? Fight or flight. Yeah, those are our, that's the way we talk about it. You've got an act out in that moment or a run away in that moment. That's just a part of how we're wired. So listen, every time you have faced opposition, you have faced persecution, you have known that your regard or respect or your name will plummet by what you do, what you say for the cause of Christ, who you are, what you don't do, what you will not say because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Every time you've seen that and you've remained faithful, it's because he's remained faithful and transitioned us to be people who are marked by courage, not by terror. He saved us from this kind of response. Loved ones, he saved Peter from this. The Peter of the Gospels is not the Peter of Acts, and it's not the Peter of the letters. Do you know that Peter would be martyred for Jesus? And he would refuse to let them crucify him in the same fashion as Christ, so he demanded that they crucify him upside down? Are you kidding me? This is one of the most bold and courageous Christians that ever lived and here he is in this moment. And if you are prone to shaking your head in some kind of self-righteousness, set that aside. We are the same terrorized people unless the faithful Christ affects our hearts and lives and leads us through his spirit to stand for him on the day of our opposition or persecution. We are blinded enemies who've been given sight. But do you know what our propensity is? It's to drift back into not seeing things clearly and to functioning as if we are not the friends of Christ, but we're actually functioning more like the enemies. And do you know who we are? We're the ones who've had our hearts changed. And yet, our tendency is to drift back toward being terrorized by what it means to be a follower of Christ, and therefore responding inappropriate in the moment of the pressure applied to us as the followers of Christ. So we become the missing nine the silent one, or the denying one. And who 
is faithful. Jesus is. He remains. Faithful Jesus stands alone inside Annas' house in order to save cowards like us and to make us courageous for the cause of his mission. It is not a personality trait. It is a miraculous work of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Amen? You see it? You see it? You see yourself? Jesus remains faithful when I am a terrified follower. He will not fail. That's the second one. So walk in courage, loved ones. Walk in courage because you have a faithful Christ who didn't just stand at trial, he died on the cross. And he didn't just die on the cross, he rose from the dead. He didn't just rise from the dead, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He didn't just ascend to the right hand of the Father, he will return for us. He's made us his people. What will, what will they do to you? What? What's the worst that can happen? Glory, that's it. That's the worst that can happen. Ours is a faithful Christ. May we walk in gospel-induced courage as we look to our Lord Jesus. That's the second, here's the third expression. Jesus remains faithful in John 18 and in us when I am a conceited authority. The end of that paragraph and beginning of verse 19 ends with Annas now sending him to Caiaphas, the high priest. So it moves out of Annas's house and up to Caiaphas's house, but the situation at Caiaphas's house is the same as at Annas's house. So we cut back and we're in a different courtyard, but now we're back to a fire. The situation at Caiaphas's house, though, gets very unique, doesn't it? Before we get back to the courtyard and back to Peter and back to the situation, we get a little glimpse into the conceited, self-appointed authority structure that was functioning around Jesus. The high priest questioned Jesus then about his disciples and about his teaching, and Jesus just won't answer him. He answers him by saying, hey, I taught in the synagogues, I taught in the temple, I taught in public, ask anybody what I taught, and, and they'll tell you exactly what I said. I didn't try to keep it a secret. And in the arrogance of the moment, verse 22, when he had said these things, one of the officers, that's one of the Jewish officers, I think the military guys have all gone back to the barracks at this point, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand. He opened hand, slapped Jesus across the face, the beginning of the physical suffering of Jesus, and he said, is this how you answer the high priest? And Jesus said, if I, what I said was wrong, show me where it was wrong. And if it was right, why are you slapping me? That's what he says. The conceited, arrogant authority structure here is just so profound. And if you're tempted to just look at them and just be like, well, I've never been like that, you must and I must come to grips with the reality that this is our propensity. This is our propensity to think of ourselves as not needing Christ, but actually that Christ needs us. To think of ourselves as over Christ that we tell him what to do, that we welcome him into whatever we want him to be in. Listen to me. The created one here slapped the creator of the universe. The man who slapped him received life like we do. We do not generate life on our own. We borrow life from the life giver. He slapped the possessor of all life. The sinner slapped the sinless one who was gonna lay down his life to cover the sins of all who would believe. Because Jesus is faithful, even when I am a conceited, self-appointed authority over him. How great is our Christ? How faithful his work for us. How many of you are parents in the room? Parents? We've got a lot of parents in here. We've got a lot of parents. How many of you are parents of kids old enough to talk back to you? Okay. All right. Somebody left their hand up a little long there, just like, Me! Those of you who aren't with us yet, enjoy this season of your life. <laughs> it will come to an end. And I believe in every culture, in every tongue, every language, I believe we all use, as parents, we all use the same, I think every generation. I think this has endured throughout humanity. If I'm banking on it, I think Adam and Eve said this to the boys back in the day. I think in every language, I certainly have heard it in every generation of my family. We say these words, who do you think you are, right? Don't we say that? Did you not hear that to you? Who do you think you are? Now, that's parenting for perspective. You seem to have become a delusional person in this moment. 
believing that you are above your authority at 11 years old. You're not allowed to interact with your teacher that way. Who do you think you are? You're not allowed to respond to your coach that way. Who do you think you are? You're not allowed to engage with your parents in that tone of voice. Who do you think? You can slow it down and see more today. Who do you think you are? What we're trying to do with that sentence in our best moments is help those kids recognize that if they don't live in reality, their life will always be plagued by hardship. But what is underneath of that is that we all are born in a conceited position. Pride is our thing. And because of it, we believe that we are the authority in most contexts. And in every moment we can express it, we do. We tend to be a people who seem like we would sing, Lord, we, we need you. But often our MO is that the song is actually, Lord, you need me. We don't have that song, thankfully, here in our church. Lord, you need me. Lord, you need me. That's not what we sing. Do you know why? You know why we don't sing that? Because our hearts have been changed by a faithful Christ who stood and endured and remained and was steadfast. Even as he was slapped, which is the beginning, his face will be bludgeoned. You won't be able to know it's him. His beard will be ripped out. There'll be blood pouring from his head. His back will be ripped off. He'll be beaten to where he can hardly stand. And he will do all of it so that the conceited, self-appointed authorities might be saved through faith in his finished work. This is not out of control. He is in control. And this is not somehow a huge mess of faithlessness. It is a glorious expression of faithfulness by our Christ. So faithful Jesus humbles himself in order to overcome our pride, to make us a people poor in spirit. Matthew chapter five, that's our, that's our position. We are the bankrupt ones. So avoid any and all delusional arrogance that puts you over Christ. And here's the thing, Christians, Christians, we're still prone to this. Because of sin remaining in us, we still drift toward this. We still drift toward delusional thinking about something that Jesus has no right over that. Are you kidding? He has all the rights over everything that he can't tell me what to do. He doesn't know the best for me. He shouldn't be involved in this part of my life. He shouldn't have any say in this particular aspect of who we are. Are you kidding? This is the Christ who came and took our place, who lived perfect obedience, died in substitution death, rose victorious from the grave, ascended the right of the fathers who returned for us. He gets the right to everything because he is the faithful Christ. So avoid all delusional arrogance and remember that we are dust who have become inheritors of an inheritance incorruptible in the presence of God. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen? Okay, fourth one, last one. Jesus remains faithful when, number four, I am a repeated failure. So Anna sends Jesus now to Caiaphas. And we come back to the fire and now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, and he said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear, the relative of Malchus was standing there, this is a funny thought, who had cut off his ear, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? With a sword? Where, where, where isn't that you? Like, I'm picturing this, like the fire flickers up, you know, Peter's got a hood on, fire flickers up, you get a little glimpse of his face, he's like, I definitely know that guy. <laughs> Weren't you in the garden? Peter again denied it. The other gospel writers tell us that he cursed. And at once a rooster crowed. And he remembered and he would never forget his repeated failure for Christ. Denial number one, when he entered the gate. Denial number two, with the group at the fire. Denial number three, at some other point, three times, he denied. 
just hours before, no doubt. Peter had been indignant in the upper room. We're talking hours before this in the upper room when Jesus in chapter 13 and verse 38 told him he would do this. He told him he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed and here he is and he has done it. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter could not hear the rooster crow without weeping his entire life. Now, I got a little bit of a weird interpretation to drop on some of you today. I don't think it was a bird. I don't think there was some crazy chicken that was up at 3 a.m. and just decided to get after it, cock-a-doodle-doing. I don't think so. In fact, I'll tell you why. Hang in there. Some of you are like, that's it, we're leaving this church. Now, hang in there. <laughs> Steady. The Romans used a trumpet call at the watch to change guard. It was a trumpet blast in the city of Jerusalem, and they called it the rooster crowing. And at 3 a.m., the rooster would crow, there'd be a blast of the trumpet, and the guard would change across the city. They did it again. That was the end of the third watch. They would do it again at 6 a.m. at the end of the fourth watch. Through the night, there were four watches, and the rooster crowing was the trumpet blast that would change the guard. I don't think this is some random rooster that woke up at 3 a.m., couldn't see anything. It was just like, I I think Peter would have to hear this the rest of his life. I think he would, in the middle of the night, hear the trumpet and again weep at his repeated failure. Jesus could see him, the other gospel writers tell us. From inside the house, he could make eye contact with Peter. So whether it was a, a bird out of time or whether it was the trumpet, all I'm telling you is this was the most horrific moment of Peter's life. The Apostle Paul could never get over the fact that he persecuted the church, and Peter could never get over the fact that he had denied Christ. He was restored from this, and yet this was always a part of his story. Through Christ remained faithful. Jesus was faithful. Jesus endured. Jesus died. Jesus rose again so that repeated failures like Peter could be saved, and that rebels could be made people who walk in repentance and could be restored and could have fellowship and could be sons and daughters. I know I tease about Peter. Peter's my guy. I'm a repeated failure. And I have a faithful Christ. I have known about Christ since I could know about anyone. And I have denied him. I have refused to submit to him. I have gone my own way. I am a repeated failure. Peter is my guy. He talks first and asks questions second. I like that. That's me. And here he is in denial. I don't know how many of you have a compulsive behavior like personality where people need to say, hey, that's enough. That's enough. Two sleeves of Oreos is enough. You need to not eat that many. That's not good. Some of you that hit a little close to home, you're like, do we need to go to the Oreos? They say, like, that's enough. You, you're the ones who watch the, the Netflix show, and it's like, it's, you know, it's when the early bird rooster was up crowing. You're like, you're still up watching Netflix. Somebody comes out and goes like, hey, you gotta turn it off. It's enough. It'll still be there tomorrow. I don't know your personality, but I know that all of us tend to think that God has a point at which he says that's enough. That's it. I was gonna give grace. I was gonna cover I was going to, are you kidding? You did it again? That's enough. I'm done. And I want to remind you this morning before we go live on mission for him that you can never go past his grace. It is infinitely applied. It is sufficient for you. His sacrifice is faithful and it is full. It is absolutely covering all the sins of all the people who are his, all of them. He is the God of second chance and third chance and fourth chance. He is the God of grace. Amen? There's no moving past his grace. Now listen, as soon as I say it, I can feel the Apostle Paul getting ready to warn us in Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. Shouldn't we just sin then all we want if grace is going to cover it? God forbid. That would mean you know nothing of grace if your view of grace is that you're going to do whatever you want and just get some more grace. Those who have experienced grace have been transformed on the inside to want what we didn't want, to love what we didn't love, to be after what we weren't after, to submit under who we would not submit under. 
But hear me now, because of the remaining sin in us, he is so faithful to us. He makes us sons and daughters. He changes our hearts. He disciplines us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Because we are actually his sons and daughters, he lovingly cares for our lives, even in our failures. Christ is faithful when I am a repeated failure. John, who's writing this, wrote 1 John 1. Verses 8 through 10, if we say we don't have any sin, we're lying. But if we'll confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To make repeating offenders into repenting followers, our faithful Christ. He never failed so that he might save failures like me and failures like you, friends and family. There's nothing that we can do that could separate us from Jesus, and Jesus does everything necessary to separate us from sin. Even in our remaining sin, he continues to work to change us. Why? Because we've been justified, so we're being sanctified. We've been declared righteous. We're being changed to look more and more like Christ, and we will be glorified. We will see him face to face. We will receive new bodies free from sin and we will in every way reflect his glory as we were intended as image bearers because he is faithful. Jesus is faithful when I'm a blinded enemy and when I drift toward blindness and enemy behaviors. He is faithful when I'm a terrified follower claiming to know him but running away from him. He is faithful when I'm a conceited authority who's delusionally put myself on a pedestal above him and he is faithful when I'm a repeated failure. He saves and he saves to the uttermost. Amen? Amen. Look to Christ, my friends, look to Christ. We learn in order to live here, so let me give you some questions to take home. We'll be finished. Number one, who am I today? Seems to be such a necessary question. Who am I today? And if you're trying to find yourself in the story and you think, I don't see myself anywhere in this, I just see myself mostly with Christ. I'm a really good person. I have to warn you, you cannot be good enough to be your own Christ. The wage of your sin and your sinfulness is death. You have to have a sinless one stand in for your sin penalty and pay it in full on your behalf, in your place. And there's only one who can do it. It is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. He is the eternal one who came and embraced our humanity so that he might save us from our sin. You must have Christ. And here's the great news. If you see, if your blindness is being removed and you see your blindness, you see yourself in your sin, you see Jesus as your savior. That's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you. Do not harden your heart. Do not stiffen your neck. You run to Christ in faith and all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen, church? That's our story. You didn't find all the good people. You found the sinners who have found a savior in Jesus Christ. Come with us. Come with us. Place your faith in him today. Church family, who you think you are today has a lot to do with how you're living today. Your identity is really crucial. You are not what you've done. You are not what's been done to you. You are not your career. You are not whatever titles you have on your name. You are who God says you are, a sinner saved by his grace through faith in the finished work of his son. Let's find our identity in Christ, the faithful one, so that on the day of judgment, we might hear, well done, good and faithful servants through his work in us. Number two, how has Christ compelled my life? I am persistently concerned about some who claim to follow Christ with no compelling change to your life. I am terrified freshly with Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, which says on the day of judgment, there will be many people who say, I did stuff for you, and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So a little examination question, what things have been different? This is a comforting question to ask for those of us who have been regenerated, who have been given new life. There's things that just aren't the same. Are we repeated failures? Yes, we are. But we see increased patterns of obedience in our lives and increased patterns of repentance when we fail. 
We see humility where there used to be pride. We see brokenness where there used to be all kinds of self-righteous strength. Would you just consider that? And would you bring that to your friends and our fellowship here in the church? Hebrews chapter three and verse 13 says that because of how deceitful sin is, we need the, the body of Christ to be exhorting us every day. Let's bring that together. Let's talk openly and honestly. Let's be transparent about where we need to grow. Number three, last question. Where will I not go for Christ? Reality is some of you, as we read Peter, you know there's a place. You know you have your own high priest courtyard. And I would encourage you that half of the battle will be acknowledging that you're scared. Praying for courage. Trusting the spirit will lead you and bringing brothers and sisters in Christ into your fear as you go for Christ, to speak his name, to live for his cause, to be about him as a worshiper in every, every aspect of our lives. Faithlessness will always be on the table for us because we're sinner saints. It's a part of our reality until we see him face to face. Run and run again to Jesus. He is the faithful Christ. His faithfulness will never fail. There is hope in Jesus. In every moment of my faithlessness, Jesus remains faithful to save. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this portion of it. Lord Jesus, thank you for your work on our behalf. May you be glorified among us as we live on your mission in the week to come. May it be obvious and more obvious because we're Christ church and we met together this weekend in John 18 that we are your people. No secret compartments of life. No drift away from who we've been saved to be. Would you work that out in us? Spirit, convict us and show us. Humble us. Use the bread and the cup now to affect us with the memory of what it costs for us to be your people. And save our friends, we pray, through faith in Jesus. We ask these things in his name. Amen. We're gonna finish our time together now with communion. If you're a follower of Jesus, uh, even if this isn't your church home, uh, we welcome you to take this with us. If you follow Christ in faith, uh, take, take the bread and the cup with us. We would count it a privilege. There are some warnings in 1 Corinthians 11, so be very careful now. Church family, be very careful. Let's be aware of ourselves. The cross broke the power of sin, so if we're living in undealt with, unrepented, unbroken pattern of sin, let's confess our sin. He is faithful and just, 1 John 1, 9, to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So be careful to not mock the cross that broke the power of sin while we live under the power of sin of our own choice. Secondly, the cross made us a people when we weren't a people. It unified us from every tribe, tongue, and nation, all the backgrounds and stories, it made us a people. So if you're living in disunity in the body of Christ, Christian to Christian, we got war. Let's pursue peace before we take the bread and the cup because the warnings are significant about mocking the cross. Consider it carefully. Send the text to pursue peace. Lean over and have the conversation. Maybe it's in your own family or friends. I don't know what it needs to be, but I want to encourage you to take this very seriously. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I just, if, if you would, I just encourage you to pass. It's going to come down your, your road. Just pass it on. It doesn't make anybody a Christian. It doesn't clean you up a little bit. So if something bad happens, you got, at least you took communion. That's not in the Bible anywhere. So consider the call for you to come to Christ today. Consider Christ. Consider whether you will follow him as your savior and just let this happen around you. If you are a follower of Christ for five minutes or for five decades, let's jump in and enjoy this remembrance together. There's two cups in here. Thank you, Andrew. The bottom one has the bread, the top one has the juice. Grab both of them as they come through as our team passes them down. Our team's gonna sing over us you want to sing with them, you can. We're going to reflect on the gospel. Repent where needed. We're a repenting people, church. And then I'll come back and lead us, and we're going to rejoice together in taking the bread and the cup. was a wretch, I remember who I was, 
Jesus on the night when he was betrayed just hours before what we're studying in John 18 took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it, he passed the bread to the men there with him in the upper room and he said this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me, let's remember his body torn for our salvation same way also he took the cup after supper the third of the fourth the third of the four cups in the meal this cup always for generations being the remembrance of God's promise for redemption to come to Israel and now Jesus assigns for every generation to come the new significance of this moment this cup is the new covenant in my blood it's the new covenant that gave new hearts that brought the spirit into the people of God that made us a people from every tribe and tongue and nation. It's the new covenant in his blood. It couldn't be accomplished by any animal sacrifice. It had to be a brother who would die in our place. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember his blood shed for our salvation. Thank you, Jesus. As often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, Paul says we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As if across the room, we're saying his death was sufficient, the cross was enough. Amen? Until he comes, the king's alive. Let's stand together. Let's praise him with our lips as we get ready to live on mission with our lives. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days. Then you walked right out again And now death has no sting And life has no end For I have been transformed By the blood of the Lamb Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, for 
darkness into glorious light. We say thank you to Jesus. There is no name sweeter, no one more righteous, no one, none more faithful to save us than him. And today, if you're thankful for that, if you... Um, were blessed by Pastor Adam's word like I was, you were reminded today of just how great and awesome Jesus is. And maybe you're here today and you've got some burdens that you wanna to talk to him about, that you wanna bring before him in prayer. We've got a prayer team in front here who would love to talk to Jesus with you about those things. So please come forward. Uh, if you, spring season is upon us, so don't forget to register for any of the groups and stuff I mentioned earlier. Please join in with us and grow together this year and this week, but don't leave without remembering that you are loved. Have a great week for Jesus.